Hey everyone, welcome to another interview. We're very excited with our guest here today, Jeffrey Poo, joining us from over in the States. Welcome, Jeffrey. Welcome. Uh, so for those who don't know, Jeffrey's the Maud Sharp Powell Professor of Religious Studies at Elon University. He's the author of a number of books, including Devil's Inc, Blog from the Basement Office, Religionless Christianity, Dietrich Bonhoeffer in Troubled Times, Entertaining the Trying Mystery of God, Science, Space, Science and the Space Between, sorry. And most recently, The Homebrewed Christianity Guide to the End Times, Theology After You've Been Left Behind. So we're very excited to have you here joining us from across the world. Yeah, thanks. So uh, starting with the uh, theology after uh, you've been left behind, I, I wanted to know just as a kind of like opening uh, foray, if you have a favorite kind of end times uh, depiction in like movies or television or kind of like whether it's like a post-apocalyptic wasteland or some harmonious utopia, what, what comes to mind? Oh God, you could go in any number of different directions. But um, so what I think, I mean, now there's a difference actually probably between apocalypse and Armageddon and the kinds of things that we'll talk about later. But for what we kind of usually view as apocalyptic movies, I like Children of Men. Mm. Um, with Clive Owen, um, you know, uh, I think that that's a pretty compelling sort of end times movie where we're trying to see about what life looks like in that dystopian future and how that's getting negotiated. And then sort of the lack of new life in that future makes that movie kind of compelling because you could almost, that's a, that's a future that's actually imaginable, right? Um, you could see that we could chemically uh, and environmentally do so much damage to ourselves that, that, that we get to that point. Um, I like actually Book of Eli. Mm -hmm. Oh um, yeah, the Denzel Washington. Denzel Washington yeah. one, you know, I don't know why. I'm probably one of the few people in the world that likes that movie, but, um, but I, I actually think that the way that narrative and text function um, in that movie, and the fact that uh, the importance of text um, and the and the way that it uh, the power that it has to um, make people either do very uh, evil and destructive things or or good and redemptive things. Um, Seventh Seal, Ingmar Bergman movie, um, sort of done in the shadow of the nuclear bomb. Mm. Um, was I think a, a sort of compelling exercise in thinking about human mortality. Um, I like the Mad Max movie since you're from Australia. Yeah, um, mm -hmm. and uh, I think those are those are pretty interesting. I, I liked Fury Road yeah. um, very much. Um, oh, yeah, I'm with you there with Fury Road, especially. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, <laughs> and then I mean, there's so many others. I mean, Twelve Monkeys, Planet of the Apes. Terminator, uh, but maybe I'll just go ahead and end with The Matrix. Yep. <laughs> um, which, you know, it, as a trilogy, I wasn't crazy about parts two and three, um, but I'm working right now, actually, even as right before I came on this interview about um, AI, artificial intelligence and human diminishment uh, for a journal article. and. Um, so I've, I've been thinking a lot about the matrix and, and the sort of uh, move that we make toward that kind of um, uh, techno Gnosticism, that, that kind of salvation by machine kind of thing uh, mm -hmm. that the singularity represents. So I, I find all of those compelling in their own different ways. Yeah, oh, fantastic. Um, Children of Men also seems to be coming into its own, like getting a kind of a renaissance uh, in this uh, kind of post-Trump, post-truth kind of time. It seems to be a lot of people rediscovering that film, which is exciting. I, I hope they do. Because yeah. I actually, of course, anything in Clive Owen is in, you know, I, I love, you know, I, I just have, you know, great respect for his work. Um, yeah. Yeah. Ah, excellent. And I mean, it's interesting that there's quite a few movies there because I, I guess the end times or like, you know, Armageddon kind of situation has become a very, uh, has a fodder for uh, a lot of creative uh, outlets. So maybe we'll see why as we, as we go forward. So, uh, just, you know, there's something, there's something about the end, right? That um, is probably central to our imagination. 
because all of us in some ways conceive of that individual end. Um, and then these things get sort of spun out in our different sort of um, imaginative frames that, that show up in religion or, you know, any kind of other structure that we as human beings create. I didn't mean to interrupt. No, no, great. No, hey, hey, uh, we want to hear you more than we want to hear me. So uh, you interrupt whenever you feel. Uh, that's great. So um, you, this book is for the Homebrewed Christianity series, which is a 10 book guide uh, coming out of that podcast, um, A Trip Fuller Runs. Uh, so what was it like to write a book for this particular series? Because I know from reading the first one, like, you know, there's a, um, you know, a level of irreverence and, and humor and you can put an inside joke in the title. What was it like to uh, kind of, yeah, undertake this? Well, it, it felt like um, it felt like I was working in a new genre, snarky theology. <laughs> um, and, it, you know, it was just it was fun. Um, I'm, I'm to the point in my career now where I, I want to write for a more general audience. Um, I have written books for academic audiences and published things for academics, but I want to write now for the more than 50 people that would, you know, read something that an academic would write. So this gave me an opportunity to do that. Um, we were at a Fortress Press reception in San Diego and uh, Tripp and Tony Jones sort of set me down and asked me if I'd be interested. And, and uh, admittedly, this was after a couple of beers, so my resistance was a little low. And uh, I, I said, sure. I said, uh, you know, can I have Jesus? And they said, no, Tripp's got that one. <laughs> and then I, I started going down the other. I said, you know, and they said, how about, do you want to do anything on the church? Nah. You know, do you want to do anything on evil? No. You know, and then they got to the end times. And because of my personal journey, um, that became, I said, that's the one I want to do because that's the one that I can, I think, relate to a broader public audience, um, especially those 30 to 35 million uh, Americans who have been captured by this left behind um, culture uh, and, and have, have sort of become a part of, um, of rapture culture. Uh, well, you mentioned the left behind uh, series and, and the immense popularity of that. Uh, for those less familiar with the series, I think in Australia, obviously people might know about it, but it's probably not as, uh, that has quite a widespread impact. Um, what is Left Behind, uh, the series, and uh, how do you feel it shaped, like what's the effect of its shaping of popular consciousness toward the end times? Well, it, it you know, the Left Behind is sort of a, a marker or a, a, a quick way of talking about a theological innovation called dispensationalism. And this was a particular th theology that arose in the 19th century um, came out of a group called the Plymouth Brethren um, in Ireland and England, uh, and specifically from the mind of uh, the creative and fertile imagination of a man by the name of John Nelson Darby. And uh, Darby um, at one point was reading his Bible, and he said that there are certain dispensations. Uh, he, he read into Scripture um, a dispensation of Adam, a dispensation of Noah, you know, a dispensation of the pro, you know, he, so he, he sort of took scripture and sliced it up into these time segments or, or dispensations and said that God's action in the world was different depending on the dispensation, right? So when he comes to the sort of, um, uh, New Testament, Christian scripture part of this, um, he, he has devised and developed a theory that meant that um, the end of the world was also its own particular dispensation. So he put together a scheme um, that he partially took from scripture and partially took from his own imagination and in this scheme, he used certain tropes and ideas and concepts that are present in apocalyptic literature um, and fused those together into a kind of map or a grid of what the end times were. And as part of this grid, he came up with this idea of something called the rapture, um, where all the believers in Jesus Christ would be taken from the earth and 
depending on if you were mid-tribulation or post-tribulation or whatever, there'd be a seven-year period of earthly history um, in which the Antichrist would be revealed and the world would come to an end and there would be horrible tribulations poured out on the earth. Uh, you know, he gets this from the book of Revelation, thinking that the book of Revelation is a forecasting of the future and not a piece of apocalyptic literature originally meant for Christians who were undergoing persecution at the hands of the Roman Empire. So this whole sort of scheme, um, and feel free to interrupt me at any point if you want clarification, this whole scheme sort of developed in such a way that many people kind of embraced it. He was a very good um, communicator of his ideas, and one of the people that embraced his ideas was a man named Cyrus Stofield, a Tennessee farmer who uh, took uh, Darby's ideas, took these dispensationalist ideas, um, put them into a uh, version of uh, the King James Bible called the Schofield Reference Bible. And um, that was published actually by Oxford University Press, one of their massive bestsellers. I wonder if they, if they ever regret that. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, through the Schofield Reference Bible and through such things as the Niagara Bible Conferences, um, Bible conferences that were held uh, in the middle of the 1800s um, in, in, uh, in, in America, these conferences led to the creation of such institutions in America as um, Dallas Theological Seminary, what is today known as Dallas Theological Seminary, um, Moody Bible Institutes, um, other kinds of things that actually really did shape the evangelical and fundamentalist mind of America. So these ideas from Darby entered into American history at exactly the same time that the fundamentalist and, and evangelical movement um, was finding its own distinct identity um, at the turn of the 19th, beginning of the 20th centuries with the writing of the fundamentals. These two sort of streams came together and formed uh, a, a significant, huge, um, and, and like I said, the estimates run from 30 to 35 million convinced doctrinal believers uh, in the ideas of Darby uh, represented by dispensationalism and in that sort of notion of the imminent return of Jesus. Um, and, and it's had a profound influence on popular culture or the popular mind in something like um, that left behind series of books uh, that was written and that have sold 63 million copies. Um, I, I would like to write a book that would sell 10,000 copies. <laughs> um, but, 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 but because uh, it has such purchase, because it has such um, uh, importance in the mind of many evangelicals in America, and, and many who just don't know any better, uh, they don't know the scripture, they don't know background of scriptural text, um, these things have ex exercised a profound, a profound amount of influence right down to uh, the impact and influence of Christian Zionists um, on American foreign policy in Israel. And we can talk about that later. But, um, and so uh, through the movies um, and, and uh, the, the left behind movies and stuff, this has also exercised a profound amount of influence on American evangelical, American fundamentalist Christianity, such that it's very difficult to have a conversation with anybody from that part of the spectrum um, about whether or not they've got it wrong because they have come to see that their interpretation is as divinely inspired as the text they read it from. So it's very difficult for them to separate out those two. I'm going to stop now. You may have questions of clarification or. Yeah, I was just thinking, um, cause like I've never watched one of the left behind uh, series, but even from um, like Simpsons episodes that deal with uh, end time stuff, you know, like it's always this kind of like two people driving in a car and all of a sudden one is like taken off to heaven kind of thing. And, and yeah, uh, kind yeah. of 
vision mm-hmm. is, yeah, even if you're not a believer, that's what you think, uh, well, that's what most people Christians are expecting. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and in fact, um, I'm just going to go ahead and make the argument that this idea is nowhere found in Scripture and in the tradition of Christianity Um, I'm hard-pressed to see a particular understanding of the rapture um, until John Nelson Darby. And by the rapture, I mean this sort of secret appearing of Jesus where he gathers his followers and then takes them to heaven. So when I was was growing up uh, back in uh, antiquity, um, there were lots of these bumper stickers on people's cars that said... uh, Warning, in case of rapture, this car will be driverless. <laughs> and uh, so I have a bumper sticker on the office, on my office door, mm. and it says, um, come the rapture, can I have your car? <laughs> so uh, so yeah. I'll, if I'm lucky, it'll be a Tesla. But, yeah. uh, but, but this, this, this sort of image, or this, this has created um, an imaginary, um, that people have internalized and then order their lives around. So there, there is a sense in which you could say that there are over 30 million people in my particular country walking around in a state of false consciousness about what the return of Christ or what eschatology sort of in toto actually means. Um, and I think it's a, a bare bones and, and uh, minimalist way of understanding um, eschatology. Uh, and it's, it's tragic uh, in some ways that so many people are captivated by it. And it, you know, I mean, it, it, it ruined Nick Cage's career. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, well, maybe that didn't have far to go, but, but um, and then it, you know, that kind of apocalyptic imagination also creates movies like uh, the Seth Rogen, James Franco. Mm. Um, this is the end, yeah. Um, which is execrable, but I have friends who love it. So yeah. I guess yeah, if one, I looked at it as kitschy camp, I would, you know, appreciate it more. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that one did come to mind. And obviously also images this kind of uh, yeah. end. Yeah. So we kind of um, mentioned that obviously this has uh, dramatic effects on how we see the world now, how foreign policy, how things like that are worked out. Um, and recently at the um, CPAC, the Conservative Political Action Conference over in the States, there was a, um, a panel which got some uh, interest, which was called, um, If Heaven Has a Gate, a Wall, an Extreme Vetting, Why Can't America? Obviously in reference to the uh, executive order on immigration. Uh, how do you see this as a reflection of this kind of dispensationalist rapture uh, end times fascination? Well, I don't know that I can make a, 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 di- a direct correlation between that particular panel um, and, and the sort of notion of rapture culture that I'm, I'm talking about. And let me just go ahead and say that one of the reasons that this, this so fascinates me is because I actually got caught up in it um, when I, I had a conversionary moment when I was a teenager. And the first thing somebody did was put a copy of the late great planet Earth in my hand. Um, by Hal Lindsey, and then, you know, that sort of started me down a, a trail that uh, I recovered from quickly, but became a lifelong interest in why people would accept that. Now, let me go back to the panel at CPAC for just a minute. That panel does reveal a particular understanding um, about God's way in the world um, and what judgment means and who is in and who is out. Um, And so the panel itself does talk about the way that the most conservative elements of Christianity in America um, are creating boundaries and fences so that they can keep out those who are not chosen from those who are, um, and and that they, they will be the ones to be able to decide that and, and they will project onto God then those decisions that they have made. So I see that panel actually as being a, a kind of um, uh, a judgment uh, of, of that particular expression of, of Christianity that says that heaven is a place where people are barred from. Um, and, you know, we all have these images of St. Peter at the gate and, and, uh, 
you know, how Peter's going to, you on this side and you on that side, right? And we all have mm -hmm. jokes about it and everything. But, but the fact of the matter is, is that we have conceptualized these concepts and ideas for a reason. And then we have projected our notions of who is chosen and who is not, who is in and who is out. We projected those onto God um, as if God were going to choose the ones that we would. Mm -hmm or reject the ones that we would. Um, so uh, that wasn't exactly necessarily uh, tied to rapture culture. Yeah. But it's tied to a kind of expression in rapture culture. And I've seen this so many times that there are, there are people in this world who will not be happy in heaven unless they know someone else is in hell. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you for that. Uh, so, now I could imagine that in response, you know, you're seeing the, like this left behind series and its prominence, the, the effects of it, the, um, you know, how damaging it can be, things like that. I can imagine people who maybe are more on a, a progressive end, uh, end of Christianity thinking maybe this is better if we stop thinking about the end times altogether. Maybe if we just like, we'll just, you know, cause it, you're worried about that whole, you're so heavenly minded, you're no earthly good. You know, you, let's just focus on being earthly good. Um, should that, be our response and if not what do you think we risk losing by forgetting or neglecting thinking of in the end yeah so I'm going to get to that question but there's something mm. that just popped into my head uh, in a follow-up to our previous one yeah and that is a, an article that Sarah Posner just uh, published um, in uh, Washington Post talks about uh, a study that's been done that says that the most rabid end timers the Pat Robertsons of the world, the, the strongest dispensationalist people are lining up um, they, behind Donald Trump because they feel like Donald Trump is God's chosen person and that we are living at the end of time. And he's not God's chosen person as the Antichrist. He's God's chosen person as the sort of the one who God has chosen to save America. Um, so that there is an alignment now between the religious right and the Trump regime um, that, that is going to be interesting going forward. Um, we can talk later in the broadcast about whether that represents the new uh, German Christians, um, at, at, you know, during Bonhoeffer's time. But, um, but going back to your question for just a second, I think that um, we, the end is important. And we shouldn't, we shouldn't let it be um, uh, colonized uh, by those who would sort of uh, narrow down or, or make the end a, a thing of thinness. Um, the end is thick. Mm -hmm. and what I mean by that is that when apocalypses are written in Scripture, um, whether it's the apocalypse of Revelation or whether it's you have apocalyptic text in Daniel or a couple of chapters in Ezekiel or you have even extra canonical apocalyptic literature like the book of Enoch or the book of similitudes or all those apocalyptic literatures that were present and circulating at the time of Jesus and also at the time of John is writing Revelation. These apocalypses are written in circumstances of great, um, political pressure and, and oppression. Mm -hmm. and, and they represent the end as a horizon of hope, not um, the sort of we are, we are st stuck in the circumstances that we are in. These circumstances will continue for the rest of our lives. There's no hope. The, the eschatological, um, in a certain sense, can be the horizon of hope. Um, that the thing that we are moving to um, in and of itself is a thing that is worth our commitments, worth um, our lives if necessary, that, that the thing that we are moving to transcends um, contingent uh, political um, commitments, um, and that the end is, is as much a telos, uh, and that, you know, the telos, the Greek goal or, or, you know, that 
that the teleology of it all um, is important to us. And so the end is not a, a it's a, the end is a destination that's not yet fixed. Um, but it is, it is that toward which we are moving. The future is that toward which God is calling us to, um, so that we should ultimately be people of hope, even in the midst of, of Babylon. Um, so, you know, I don't want to give up the end. I don't want to give up the eschatological to um, the end timers, mm -hmm. because I think that the end is far, far more significant and richer um, than just this uh, notion of, of Jesus is coming back to save you uh, and kill all your friends. <laughs> yeah, I think... Um... Uh, there was a, a quote that I kind of came across in like reading in the week leading up to this was from James Cone in, in Black Theology and Black Power. He says, with the black perspective, eschatology comes to mean joining the world and making it what it ought to be. It means that the Christian man looks to the future, not for reward or possible punishment of evildoers, but as a means of making him dissatisfied with the present. Um, and I was thinking of like, you know, we know like, you know, Martin Luther King Jr.'s great speeches where, you know, he speaks of like, I've seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. And he talked about the mountaintop and I might not get there, but that's where we're going. Um, so it seems like that there is this ability of the of eschatology to not only create dissatisfaction with the present, but kind of sustain along the journey toward that, that telos goal. Yeah, I mean, if you think about it, I mean, and, and we're... Um we're dealing pretty significantly with this right now in American culture. And my apologies to um, your Australian children's writer. Oh, uh, yeah. And, yeah. Uh, what a horrible, horrible thing. Mm -hmm. We're dealing with the notion of what is the beatific vision? I mean, what is the vision of paradise or heaven um, in a sense that motivates Christians? Um, and there is a way in which you could say that, well, part of that vision is the erasure of all evildoers, um, the erasure of all of those who transgress. Um, and you, you, you know, there's, you know, there's, this is the great thing about scripture, right? You see that so in, in Revelation. You, you can't read that sort of apocalyptic text and, and not see um, that there is that separation right um and we can come back to this because i think you know that's one of the great problematics of, of christianity but you also see the vision of those who were gathered around the throne who worship and they're not all of one uh race they're not all of i mean your young men your old men your your women and you know i mean look at those places in scripture that are inclusive um, is the vision is the sort of the vision of the lamb uh, ultimately a vision of inclusion or is it a vision of exclusion and depending on how you sort of understand or, or see that that becomes a kind of motivating factor for your life i think cone saw the inclusive vision i think martin luther king jr saw the inclusive vision of what the reign of God looks like. What would the reign of God look like in the world? I think Acts 2 is, a, is part of that inclusive vision where the diversity of the nations is sort of brought together. Now, I want to be, be a little careful about what that inclusiveness means because I'm actually going to go ahead and, and be a little bit heretical here. The inclusion may be those who you think are excluded. So um, I'm thinking about C.S. Lewis's book now, The, uh, the Last Battle. Mm. Um, and for all the anti-Muslim um, signifiers in, the, in that sort of children's series and the Chronicles of Narnia and, um, and for all the things that we could go back and we could sort of read and see and understand, there is that part in The Last Battle where, and I can't remember which one of the little children is asking Aslan, um, about uh, somebody that's going higher up and further in with them. And, uh, and Lewis has Aslan respond, well, they thought they were serving Tash, but in, in effect, they were actually serving me. Um, 
there are those surprises in the eschatological vision, um, right? Just like there are surprises at the feast where those who are, were invited um, find themselves on the outside looking in, and those who were on the outside on the periphery, on the margins of society, find themselves eating at the feast. Well, we're structuring our culture now in America in such a way that we are marginalizing and pushing to the periphery um, those without social power, um, those who are of a different religion, those who are of a different ethnic uh, mix. And, and these, this is going to lead to some significant, huge societal problems in our country if we can't resolve that. And that's catalogical vision of the table of Christ um, runs directly counter to what the political vision of exclusion would, would build for us and structure for us in a society. Mm. Well, that's great. That's a good tweetable moment for those who, when you're watching this interview, shoot that one out. Uh, so you're also the author of, as I mentioned before, Devil's Inc. blog from the basement office. Now, uh, in this book, you kind of write from the perspective of Satan to engage in a social critique on the way we often ignore what is structurally wrong with the world and get distracted on like politicians and marriages and things like that. Uh, how did switching up the perspective from which you wrote the book uh, help enhance or shape this social critique? And what were some of your big takeaways from the process? Yeah. So let me just go ahead quickly and say that um, when I started it, um, I was trying to attack an understanding um, that has arisen in some quarters about the problem of evil as being a personal decision. Um, you know, so sin is something that we do personally. Um, we don't look often at how structures operate to manifest um, evil in the world or sin in the world. So let me just go ahead and give you a story about uh, maybe one of the motivating factors that uh, led to the book. I was teaching a class of, um, of pastors at Duke Divinity School in North Carolina uh, during the summer. And the, uh, the United Methodist Church in America has a, um, a process by where if you, if you didn't go to seminary, but you still feel called to ministry, um, if you do five summers of, um, of, uh, of, of seminary training, uh, and these are called course of study schools, you can, you can become ordained, um, a, a, albeit at a lesser level, and then you'll, you'll go out and serve churches. And many of the churches that these people serve are not going to be the big steeple churches. Um, they're going to be the five church circuits, you know, mm -hmm. out in the Carolina low country or the, or the mountains. So you have a, a deep sense, I have a deep sense of admiration for those people that are sort of, that follow this path. And I was teaching the first year theolo theology um, class. And now most of these are second career people. Uh, a lot of them were retired military. Um, this was back in the day when I had a beard and my earring and, and uh, Birkenstock, so I'm pretty sure that they thought I was a patchouli stinking Birkenstock wearing granola eating hippie. Um, and so I would go into class every day, and and they they would be living together at Duke for uh, one month uh, while they were doing these um, these classes. And I'm pretty sure that they would figure out uh, during their nightly sort of you know hanging out, what are we going to try to get him with tomorrow. <laughs> Because every day I'd come in and they would just kind of have a thing where they, just, you know, <laughs> you know, and, and um, so these are very Southern people in America. I'm not sure for your listeners, I'm not sure that they're going to be able to relate. I don't know if there's any kind of um, uh, analogous uh, group in, in Australian culture, but, but Southerners have their own particular and distinct accent and, and way of being in the world. And that can be good and bad. Anyway, um, so I'd go in, they'd say, Preacher, what are, do you believe the Bible is the word of God? Or, you know, do you believe that Jesus died for our sins? Or, and uh, one day I came in and, and they said, uh, Preacher, do you believe in the devil? I said, well, so let's think about that. I said, what does the Bible call the devil? So I threw it back on them and they started in with the names, you know, 
he's Beelzebub, he's the father of lies, and, you know, he's Satan, and, and all these things. And finally, somebody said, he's Apollyon, the destroyer. I said, okay, so let's stop right there. So anything that destroys is of Satan. Can I get an amen? And, and these people are like, amen, amen, amen. And so I started going down the list uh, that usually they, they, they have, um, which is constitutes a pelvic theology because sin is anything that happens in the region of the pelvis. So abortion and fornication and, you know, and, and all kinds of things. And I'm, I've got them going. And I said, and nuclear weapons and anybody that justifies their existence or their production is of Satan. Can I get an amen? And there was stone silence in the room. And then finally someone, this voice in the back of the room said, preacher, you're taking us somewhere we don't want to go. And we had the best conversation then about the way in which evil cloaks itself as necessity. Um, you know, so that we have, I said, so, so what greater sort of expression of Satan could you have than the existence of something that can destroy the good creation of God 15 times over until the rubble is bouncing? And, and in your minds, you have to call it necessary for this to exist. I said, that is the absolute apex of evil, that, that, that the, the, the destruction of the world, um, you have created the destruction of the world and you keep adding onto the arsenal because of your fear and you call your fear necessity. So that's by way of saying that structurally speaking, um, we we've, don't take account sometimes of the animating kind of energies, what John Maynard Keyes called sort of the animal spirits, I think. Um, the animating energies that we put into play by our creations, and then those animating energies sort of create as they move along and they escape our control. I mean, the nuclear genie is out of the bottle. Um, we, we have not been able to put that back, and the world has lived in total fear since 1944, 1945, excuse me, that, that that's going to happen. Uh, and now we have North Korea um, sort of heating up. So now we're all, we're fearful. Well, this is, this is satanic. This is demonic. This is a kind of energy um, that transcends a personal act. These are energies that we put into play with our creation of the world and, and the results of those energies sort of continue to spin out in, in ways of darkness. So in the book, Devil's Inc., I, you know, I, I talk about politics. I talk about economics. I talk about the state. I talk about religion. Religion is one of those sort of manifest energies that we create in the world. And then we project ourselves into those structures um, and in the projection of ourselves into those structures, uh, like we were talking about just a minute ago, we project those who are in and those who are out. And not only do we project that those are in, those are out, but we project God's will onto those that we, we ourselves have chosen as being outside the realm of grace, outside the realm of, of, um, of redemption. Um, so that, so that in the book, and I try to do this in a snarky and sort of funny way, you know, like, like Disney is the worst example of satanic uh, imagination that you, can, that, you can, that you can get because, you know, uh, Las Vegas is not demonic. Las Vegas is very open about what it is. It tells you what it is. It says, if you want to come here, um, we're going to fleece you. We're going to take your money. We're going to give you the sort of uh, 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 the, the counterfeit notion of what a true good time is. And, and when you go home, you'll have that memory of the shame that you got here. What stays, in, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas, right? But Disney's so subtle because it works through extortion, you know? I mean, what parent can can 
can say to their child, no, you can't have that, that little mermaid doll, or you can't have that, that Merida, you know, game or anything, or no, we don't want to take you to Disney World. No parent's going to do that. Disney makes the same amount of money that Las Vegas does. It just does it by manipulating the desires of your children. Um, this is this is Satan sort of laying this out um, in the in the thing. Um, but I also talk about the way that memory functions um, uh, to and forgetfulness functions, not in the positive way, but in the way that leads to continuing atrocity. Um, and and so the book itself is I try to sort of humorous in a satirical way show that. We have been captured um, as human beings in the structures, in the very political structures that we built. We've been captured by a kind of spirit that animates us, that ultimately does not lead to the things uh, or the fruits of the spirit um, or the things of grace, but it leads to the destruction of the world, the exclusion of others, uh, the uh, the increasing numbers of hungry, poor, immigrant, and refugees. I mean, there's so much talk about refugees now. There's no talk about what the structural forces were that created the kind of refugee patterns, the migration patterns that we see now. Mm -hmm. Nobody wants to unwind that back to what were the influences, for instance, of the CIA and the Iranian government in 1952 what were the influences of lies that were told during the Iraq war and run up to the Iraq war that created so many refugees from Syria and Iraq? You know, we create all of this destruction and then we do it under the name of, of good, um, but it's still destruction. Yeah. So, so the takeaway that I, I want the reader to get from that particular book is that the things that, that are most cloaked to us um, as necessity, as a political need, as cultural um, assumption, those assumptions are the very things that need to be most severely critiqued and are, are often the least critiqued because they have worked their way into us mm -hmm. to the point where, well, that's just the way things are. Yeah. No, that's the way we created them. And, and, and that's, not, that's not the way things are. You're, you're talking about some kind of ontological reality external to you that your society conforms to, and, and that's just not what we've done. We have created these structures, and then we have invested um, the sort of objective world into them, and that, that just doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's fascinating. I definitely recommend people check that out. I'm, I'm going to do so myself. So... Uh, moving broader, uh, we mentioned before you're a professor of religious studies at Elon University. And in the past, you've taught the, the topic uh, Theologians Under Hitler. Uh, and you also wrote the book we mentioned before, Religionless Christianity, Dietrich Bonhoeffer and Troubled Times. So re recently, much has been written about the parallels between the uh, current US context and the early days of Hitler's Germany. And, and the name Bonhoeffer gets invoked on both sides of, of the right left. Uh, divide everyone wants uh, everyone wants Jesus and Bonhoeffer on their side it seems yeah, yeah, um, yeah. so um, and specifically within these discussions there's been a, a talk of what should be the response of Christians and, and theological institutions like I think Princeton seminary recently did a big statement kind of thing so there's a lot of this in the ether uh, what do you make of these comparisons of the times and what do you think uh, should be like theologians under Trump should be doing yeah oh dear God <laughs> Um, yeah, okay, so and let me just back up for just a minute and say that this is not World War, this is not Weimar Republic. Um, the circumstances in America and the rest of the world, really, because what's happening in America is also being spun out mm. in Europe. Um, I don't know what, what things are like exactly in Australia. Um, okay. Right There's now. definitely ripples of it here in our political climate too. So yeah, but um, the sort of uh, reaction to a, a world of um, uh, of diverse inclusion of uh, maybe those who who do not have power um, um, asking for some power. Um, so it it can't be a direct parallel, um, and I, I wouldn't want to assume that it is. 
But, but here's the thing. Um, I don't know if you've heard the term, or I'm sure you've come across the term God wants law, right? Mm. I'm the first person to mention Hitler in an argument loses, <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, well, one of the things that we've done is we've, we've made of Hitler, uh, we've, he's a fetish um, in a, in, of evil in a mm. certain way. So that we can look at Hitler and we can sort of hold him at arm's length and we can say, well, we're no Hitler, you know? Well, yeah, we didn't kill, you know, six million Jews and four million. I mean, we didn't kill, you know, 10 million people or set in, in motion that which did. Um, but to make Hitler the personification of evil and to remove him from human experience as uniquely demonic um, puts blinders on us as to how political systems and totalitarian uh, systems operate um, because there have been other people in, in culture and in society who run autocratic regimes, who run totalitarian regimes, who under the guise of keeping us safe um, have brought in totalitarianism, uh, which is, you know, I mean, writers like Orwell and, and others warn us of, these are some of the best apocalyptic movies probably warn us of the kind of totalitarianism that comes from keeping us safe. Mm -hmm. So we are, I think, in a unique moment. Um, and, and I'm an old man, and this is a moment unlike any I lived through the 60s. Um, and this is a moment unlike any that I've known in American society. Because we could go either way. Um, there is a way in which a path that we could follow that whatever fragility democracy has uh, will go by the wayside. And one of the things that we don't realize, and, and this is a part of the reason I think we're a little bit different than um, uh, Germany was in, in uh, late 20s and early 30s, all societies are fragile. Um, a society exists to the ability uh, and the willingness of its inhabitants, of its citizens, to sort of agree on a, on a story. And once you stop agreeing on the story, your society is imperiled. Because if you don't have a story you can agree on, um, then identity gets uh, structured in, in, in whatever way uh, a demagogue can come in and, and twist, that, twist that story. Um, Right now, I think we have people in places of power that would be more than happy to impose a type of story on American society and American culture where they're the only narrative, um, they're the only story that is able to hold uh, political power and political sway. And, and that the other competing narratives or other stories aren't allowed a place in the public square. I think that that is what is, is happening. And, and that could, and that happens because those people probably felt that for a long time, liberals had the narrative or the power of the story and that the world that they were constructing is, is one that they felt uncomfortable in. Um, the white, Christian America narrative um, is one that has strong appeal, and that's being appealed to by Steve Bannon, by Breitbart, by the sort of white supremacists um, that are finding a voice in this country that they did not have before. So the stigma of racism, for instance, um, and of being racist is sort of diminishing um, with the sort of um, rise in political power, for instance, of the Trump regime. So in that circumstance, um, you can go in a number of different directions. And what I think is important for the Christian uh, to think about or reflect upon is, well, in, in the middle of this, what does the gospel look like? Um, what is Jesus talking about in Matthew 15? One of the responses to this sort of movement in our country is, a, is a, something called the Matthew 15 movement, which a number of people are, are saying that, you know, one of the core sort of um, 
text or narrative of the gospel is, when did we see you hungry? When did we see you poor? When did we see you a refugee? When did we see you in jail? And Jesus said, in as much as you did it to the least of these, you did it to me. Um, the ability or the willingness to see the Christ in the other um, it is, is going to be a challenge for Christians going forward. Now, one of the problems in Bonhoeffer's, um, uh, in Bonhoeffer's day is that the Jew uh, was considered the other. Um, and this has, uh, you know, had 19 centuries of Christian anti-Semitism um, behind it. Um, if you can have a Lutheran bishop by the name of Sasa put together Luther's uh, extracts from Luther's writings on the, on the Jews that he wrote it toward the end of his life and use those as propaganda for the German people to burn down synagogues, then Christianity is complicit. It was complicit in the persecution uh, of the Jews and the Holocaust. Um, and I can, if, if this is a controversial claim for your readers, um, I'd be happy to come to Australia and, uh, and, and have a little chin wag about it because this is just historically the case. Um, not, and, and, and it can't, it can't be denied. It's just look at the Christian writings. Um, the anti-Semitism, the anti-Jewishness was, had always been sort of there in Christianity, sometimes leading to programs and sometimes not. Well, now we have a situation in which Christians now are being called upon to say who is going to speak for the Muslims. Um, and, in the, and in the time in which we live, um, what does the gospel have to say to those of a different faith community um, for the way in which we will protect them or for the way in which we will stand with them or for the way in which we will not let them be um, bullied or killed or, or oppressed in this particular country? And, and, and make no mistake about it, they are the new scapegoats. Um, the Muslim community, I mean, we've, we've had uh, uh, an increasing rash of um, Sikh um, yeah. attacks in this country because of the, of, you know, their, their difference is so apparent with the turban, for instance. Um, so, so Christians are coming to a time in which they're going to have to ask, are we created in the image of God or not? Um, are we all created in the image of God or not? Is that a child of God or not? No matter if they have a different religious perspective than yours, let God sort that out. Um, that's, not, that's not your concern. Your concern is to feed and clothe and, and give shelter to. Um, I'm, I'm pleased to that statement from Princeton uh, Theological Faculty uh, was reminiscent of Barman um, because they, they asked where will our ultimate allegiances be? Ultimately, where will our ultimate allegiances be? And their ultimate allegiances are going to rest with Jesus Christ. Now, this is going to make Christians on the other side of that divide very uncomfortable. And I guess what I want to say to my Christian brothers and sisters on that side of the divide is, back in the 1930s, millions of Christians approved of what Hitler was saying. Millions of Christians approved of what Hitler was doing because he told them that they were on the right side of Providence, that Providence had brought, and he used Providence with a capital P. Hitler had a theology, and, and, and his theology was wrapped up in this sort of blood paganism of blood and soil. Um, Donald Trump is our first pagan president, and uh, his appeals to blood and soil, to the kind of white identity um, that are going out are a distinct challenge to the church to decide if it's going to be a part of a right-wing death cult or if it's going to be a part of the church of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. um, and I can't make it any blunter than that. Um, and and, and I, even in the midst of that, though, um, I hope that I can find a space that to sit down with those on the other side of that political divide. I, I've often said that I'm more Anabaptist than I am a Democrat or Republic. <laughs> Republican. Um, and, and what I mean by that is that the Anabaptist community from the 16th century onward 
had a very healthy skepticism of the state, mm. of state power, of magistrates. And I think Christians all along the political spectrum um, would do well to have a healthy skepticism of the state. I don't think liberal Christians had enough healthy skepticism of Obama mm. um, and the drone wars. Um, but, but at some point, um, what scares me is, is that if uh, Posner is right in her article in the Washington Post, then we have millions of, um, of uh, self-professed Christians in this country who will align themselves with the expulsion of Muslims, probably with the detention of Muslims and, and any uh, other uh, different groups. And in that way, we do sort of mirror a recurring historical phenomena because it, it, Hitler didn't initiate this kind of thing and he wasn't the last in a series. Um, he may have been unique in the way that he brought the bureaucratic mechanisms of the state um, to mass extermination. Um, and we can talk about that in another podcast at some point, but, but he's not unique in the way that the scapegoating of others um, and the creation of, of um, particular outgroups in society and culture um, lend themselves to the ultimate destruction of a society, even as they think that they are protecting themselves from the infringement and danger of those on the periphery. Thank you for that. That was an excellent response. And uh, I think the bluntness is necessary in times such as these. So I really hope that people take a lot from that. There's a lot to chew over. Uh, and we'll be certainly thinking about that in groups. Uh, I'm aware of the time that we're, we're going over. So um, basically, um, how can people connect with you, uh, stay up to date with your work, uh, reach out to you if they have questions um, coming out of this? Yeah, what's, how's the best way to get to doing that? Well, uh, you know, for me personally, you can always just... Uh reach me through Elon University, E-L-O-N um, University, and uh, just go to the Religious Studies page and, and you, can, um, you can link up with me there. Uh, I wish I, I could say that I had a blog site, but um, I put one up uh, when Devil's Inc. came out. Mm. Um, and then after uh, uh, the comments got um, uh, <laughs> so um, angry, uh, I actually took that blog site down. Um, I'm getting ready probably to launch another blog, hopefully launch another blog site in a, in a month. I, I can't figure out whether to call it entertaining mystery or, um, or religionless Christianity, mm -hmm. uh, but, but I'm working on it, but it's not there yet. Yeah. Um, and if your readers uh, are interested in Bonhoeffer or religion and science mm. or, or, um, or the end times, um, I have, I have those books that you've alluded to. Yeah, so definitely everyone check out the books, uh, pick them up, Devil's Inc., Blog from the Basement Office, Religionless Christianity, Dietrich Bonhoeffer in Troubled Times, Entertaining the Train Mystery, and as we've mentioned before, The Home Good Christianity, Guide to the End Times, Theology After You've Been Left Behind. So pick them up, uh, review them five stars on Amazon, all those good things that we need. And uh, Jeffrey, thank you very much for taking the time to talk with us today. Uh, we've really appreciated your insight and wisdom on this topic. Well, thanks for having me, Lynn. And uh, maybe in the future, uh, our paths will cross. That'll be, be wonderful. <laughs> Thank yeah. you very much. <laughs> Take care. Take, thanks.